we have more information about that than ever before. But what it's done in sticking to the um, uh, comparison level and emphasizing the testing over um, the process and products that we're uh, creating is we're demoralizing a, prof a profession. Uh, a profession of, and especially in the districts that we have here, a profession made up of some, some very, very, very fine teachers. And, and so uh, I don't believe in the, that old statement that the beatings will continue until morale improves. That doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think there's a balance here between uh, communities need to know and, and should know how their schools are doing, uh, but that's not done on a single based on a single test at a single point in time uh, when it's usually flu season. Uh, I think you need multiple measures yep. to show what we're doing in an honest and forthright manner, and we need to be transparent about sharing that with our communities so they can make the judgments on virtually every Phi Delta, Delta Kappa Gallup survey every year, they ask folks to rate their schools. And most folks rate their local schools A or B. They rate somebody else's school D and C. Uh, so, uh, so I think we have some things to do. I don't want to uh, sweep that uh, under the rug. We have some subgroups of kids that we need to do a better job at teaching. Uh, but I think you need to be very careful when we talk about the assessment uh, model to make sure that there are multiple measures so that you get a real reading on how your school is uh, doing, your school district is doing, not a false reading, which, by the way, would lead to faulty solutions and therefore more dollars. Okay. Um, one of the things the race to the top seems to be doing is using testing to the improve teaching and learning but maybe also evaluating teachers mm -hmm. is this is the thing what, what's going on I, well that's it's a good question actually there um yes there there are <laughs> A couple of things that are all kind of happening at the same time, and this confluence of different issues is, I think, what's contributing also to some of the confusion uh, I know that even as educators some of us have about how this will play out. Um, a couple of things that are occurring all at once. Um, at the federal level, we're hearing some dialogue um, that you may or may not be aware um, has indicated from the President and from the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, that um, they will be considering allowing waivers for states from elements of the No Child Left Behind legislation if the states meet certain requirements. And one of the requirements that states would be required to meet in order to uh, apply for a waiver is that teachers and principals would be partially evaluated on the basis of student achievement. Now. Um, that can be done a number of ways. Um, there's some thinking that that would necessarily equate to summative standardized mm -hmm. test scores. Um, there has, there's actually a system in place called va a value-added assessment that um, until relatively recently people had looked at as offering a lot of promise, but now some of the psychometricians have found that there's some inherent flaws with the value-added um, assessment of teachers. It would basically allow us to track students over time uh, separate from uh, the cl class cohorts where they're conventionally being evaluated. And you'd be able to see whether or not a child made one year's worth of growth with one year's worth of instruction, regardless of which classes they were in. But as I mentioned, that they have found some, some statistical problems with the model that was going to be used in order to accomplish that goal. So uh, that is a component of what you're speaking. At the same time here in Illinois, um, we have two pieces of legislation that have significantly impacted the way in which uh, we've kind of viewed the issue of teacher and principal evaluation. One is uh, the PARA legislation you may have heard of. Um, help me with this, colleagues. Performance Evaluation uh, and Review Act, I believe. That um, was in, passed last year. And then this year, of course, um, with um, Senator Lightford's leadership, uh, Senate Bill 7, both of which together have implications for teacher evaluation and will require um, taken in tandem that teachers and principals 
be evaluated at the minimum, uh, they're saying now, 30 percent of their performance based upon student achievement, and potentially as high as 50 percent if school districts are unable uh, in the next several years to work collaboratively with their education associations to develop a model, um, and then are required to use the state default model. So there are lots of implications kind of coming down the pike with this. I guess the important question to ask would be, you know, what, what is the value of this? And at the end of the day, um, not to uh, skirt around the question that, that's on the table, but really the issue is how can we provide um, for accountability such that we can ensure, as Dr. Roberts said earlier, that we're putting great teachers in front of students on a regular basis in every classroom. And then secondly, and just as, or maybe even more importantly with veteran teachers, how can we provide for their necessary professional growth and development? Because like any profession, educators need to grow, they need to learn, they need to have opportunities um, to improve and become master teachers. And it's difficult because we're trying to use one tool to accomplish two goals. Um, and the old saying is, uh, you know, if, if all you have is a hammer, uh, ev everything you see looks like a nail. And uh, I'm not sure that's the case. It's hard to have evaluation systems in place that are effective both for ensuring accountability, which is necessary, but also at the same time really making sure that teachers are given the the supports they need to grow and be success, successful in their occupation. I, I would support testing uh, in two ways. One as a diagnostic instrument that informs instruction. And if the reliability and validity is correct, then I can support it uh, judging your professional staff uh, uh, through uh, the process. but. The evidence right now is that the flaws in No Child Left Behind testing um, has um, uh, not done a good job of sharing with the public uh, the real state of their schools. Uh, the single test focus we've talked about already, but there are a couple of other things that come to mind. The double dipping failure rate, if you have a child who is in three different subgroups and that child fails AYP, counts three times. Uh, if a small subgroup, you have 45 youngsters and it's a subgroup of some type, and maybe it's uh, English as second learners or whatever it may be, if five of those youngsters fail, the whole school fails. Uh, those just don't seem reasonable to me in terms of trying to project what your school system is doing. What is reasonable is to fess up, gee, we still have not done a very good job with our economically disadvantaged kids. Gee, we have not done a really good job with our kids who are in our special ed program. We need to step it up. Uh, that, it's, it's not about um, the test score for me. It's about has that child, in, and you stole my thunder because I've been pushing that for a long time, has every child grown at least a year in a year's time? That to me uh, signals the success of a school system. And if they can find a way, a better way to do that, I'd be 150% behind it. Right now, the track record in terms of the statistical way they are utilizing the No Child Left Behind law doesn't add up to something that uh, I, as an educator, as a citizen, can stand behind. This seems misleading. And we have to understand as well that the way that we are using that model now is a moving target for, for schools. So. It, so like Dr. Roberts said, if we're, if we're improving, we're still not making the marks in some areas, especially with our subgroups, if, if the, uh, the goal that we're trying to reach for uh, adequate yearly progress is constantly being moved till we get out to 2014 where it will be 100%. The other thing that I wanted to add to this is there are different ways that other states and, and entities are looking at including uh, teacher performance in evaluations. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just with the teacher. Because what some of, some of the research is finding that is demoralizing <laughs> uh, and things of that nature. So they look at groups of teacher. Um, um, your third grade team, uh, maybe in my area, the, the, the categories of, of special education looking at different ways instead of just one teacher 
in order to add that evaluation piece in there. Dialing back and doing a really big picture of the whole country. Mm -hmm. We've got many states and many school districts in states with a lot of um, disadvantaged, well, I'll call them disadvantaged, high poverty, children who need a lot of help. And those states or districts may not choose to give those, or they may not have the resources, they may not choose to give the resources. What should we be looking at as a, as a nation? You know, it's, it's, it's not all about money. Um, certainly you need to fund uh, to an extent, but it, it's really about having uh, the right mindset. It's about having a program that's a rapid response and prescriptive and flexible. It's about allowing uh, creativity and ingenuity to take part uh, in the school system. And I, my, my fear over the last several years has been that each year we seem to cut back on um, the um, ability uh, for our staff members to be creative because we are locking them up so much with requirements and rules and regulations uh, that uh, their focus has, uh, has I think, uh, been turned toward doing well on a test and or on reading and math only. And while we still need to do better on that, I'm not arguing it, I'm not sure that that has netted the kind of results that one would expect. And I've heard the definition of insanity being continuing to do something and it's wrong every time. You keep doing this wrong thing. And so we have to look at test scores. We have to look at other measurements and say, okay, if we're not getting the results we want, what else can we try? We, we have to free people up to be creative uh, and to have the uh, wherewithal, which is not only money, but permission, support, um, uh, uh, a uh, framework from which to work uh, to really address those uh, those issues, and as I said, we have uh, we have our own issues right here uh, in District 97. So I'm, uh, I'm I'm speaking on behalf of frankly all school systems. I had a, a, a situation where we want to go back to the testing thing for just a second, where I had youngsters who scored 90, I think 8 percent on the science test. For, and, and in Michigan, they used uh, science, math, social studies, and uh, reading for uh, uh, testing purposes. And the following year, comparing against a different set of kids, unless the kids scored 98%, the school was going to be a failure. So again, I'll go back to the faulty uh, solutions. We, got, we have to use the information we have to design creative, innovative ways to reach out to the youngsters we're not reaching, but we also want to recognize that we're reaching an awful lot of kids and we have an awful lot of success in our schools. The other piece of, of that is not all about funding. It is about looking at other factors that may play a part in students not uh, re reaching the mark, so to speak, on the assessments. There's a huge um, concern with our social emotional well-being of our students and I see it a lot in my programs because it, end, it ends up coming back door into special education and students qualifying for special education under other health impairment due to mental illnesses, um, drug addictions and things of that nature and so looking at that whole picture, that whole child, uh, which sometimes does call for more funding for some more supports but also linking with community organizations and seeing how we can partner in helping our students that does have a positive impact on their on their testing scores and just their learning in general not just testing scores well there's an awful lot of research now also uh, brain research about how kids learn and and I mentioned before that some schools are doing away with phys ed and the evidence is if kids uh, eat well and exercise well that they usually learn better uh, and so we need to take advantage of the neurosciences uh, as well. And uh, when I say it's not just about money, let me give you an example. Uh, we changed the schedule of, uh, at our middle school for two APs this year and said, you're going to be responsible for really following a small group of students who are struggling learners because we want them to succeed. But you're going to do it later in the day 
and you're going to have contact with uh, parents. You're going to run some after-school things with the youngsters. Now, uh, I suppose you could look at it as it costs us money in that I don't have somebody there at the start of the school day, but the budget wasn't hit. They're just working different hours. And so I think there are ways we can rearrange the way schools are typically thought of to provide some services in a different fashion, not necessarily very different services, but in a different time frame and different manner uh, that will help youngsters uh, succeed. So again, uh, I'm on a little bit of the creativity and ingenuity count. In fact, uh, this country uh, is known for our creativity and ingenuity. Countries around the world send their folks here to learn about how creative we are. Uh, and, and I don't want to lose that in, in our, our uh, teaching. I certainly don't want our kids to lose it. When I go to an open house here in Oak Park, I see some, and again, I've been in uh, four states about in, in my 40 years. Uh, six different school systems. I've never seen one, uh, t I've seen a typical teacher strategy on that open house night is uh, at the kindergarten level, draw a picture of what you want to be when you grow up. I have never been in a district that had so many ballerinas, architect, the creative arts thrive in how our kids see themselves. Our duty and responsibility needs to make sure they don't lose that vision along the way and don't give up on being creative and and uh, using the ingenuity to succeed in school. And, and I guess if, even if you are the kind of person that says, you know, maybe it is kind of about money, <laughs> because there are those of us who think in those contexts as well, um, you know, the reality is that it costs about eight times as much money um, to incarcerate mm -hmm. someone in this nation than it does to provide a high quality education over the course of a year. And we have one of the highest incarceration rates in the world. And um, those are lives that uh, represent lost opportunities. And so I'm a big believer, you know, we're, we're very fortunate uh, within this room that we are able to provide uh, in our local communities the funding for programs that can help kids have opportunities. But that's not the case everywhere in this country. Um, that is, again, part of, you know, the flaw of our thinking that, um, uh, you know, what, what Al had spoken about earlier with what represents a, fail or a failure or a failing school. I think uh, the Secretary of Education has indicated that as of next year with the current uh, thresholds that will represent passing AYP, uh, somewhere around 82 percent of the schools in this country will be designated as failing schools. And I don't, I don't buy that. So, um, you know, we have to rethink the way in which we're providing the resources for educators, the way in which uh, students are um, being given or not being given opportunities, and then we do need to do that with an eye to equity because every child is someone's child and uh, they all represent opportunities that are either provided or lost. What every school system in this country should do if we're really concerned about return on investment is invest in early childhood. All the indicators are there. All the studies show that if we invest in early childhood, it pays off very well up and down the line. And yet, you know, in tax tough times, tough economic times, we tend to not put the dollars there. I know folks who work for children museums, and they indicate that they never get the kind of donation stream that the regular museums do, that people think of kids and they give them pennies. Uh, and yet that's our, uh, that's our truest investment on return on investment is in early childhood. Okay, so we're moving on to, we've moved into funding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, national, the federal government, starting with land grants, did, has done some contributions, but education in this country has largely been locally controlled. Um, over time, the federal government has been growing. I mean, for example, they've done categorical spending for low income, for special education. And now, with the race to the top, they've also switched over to what I think of as carrot and stick funding. You will have charter schools, and you, know, you will do these things, and we'll give you some money. Um, so what are the pluses and minuses of these things? And 
What do we need more of from the federal government? Well, or more I, or less of? <laughs> it'd be, it would be interesting if uh, when they indicate their, the federal government indicated it's going to fund that they would allocate the money for that. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 truth of, the truth of the matter is they promise us about 40 percent for special ed funding, the IDEA grant, and I don't know of school systems that have ever gotten more than 20 percent. And, and so, um, it's, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. so, uh, so the, it'd be a different argument if uh, it were promises made, promises kept from, from the federal government, but that's not how it appears to me. Um, I think that uh, we are uh, on a little bit of a slippery slope, although I don't disagree with that. There's got to be funding. I, I just said it wasn't all about funding. But I think we're on a slippery slope when we leave funding uh, in major proportion uh, to the federal government for education when it's not in the Constitution. Uh, and I, so I think there's some constitutional issues as well as practical issues uh, when you're looking for more dollars from the federal government. Now, there are lots of ways people fund schools. In, in Michigan, the local tax dollars didn't go to your local district. They went to uh, Lansing and were redistributed on a per pupil amount. So if you gained students, your school was doing pretty well. If you lost students, uh, it was terrible. And right now, they're really suffering. If you think we have it bad here, travel uh, a, a little east. So I'm not suggesting that's the way, but I am suggesting that there are a variety of ways to look at school funding that probably uh, in my way of thinking, make more sense than relying on the federal government to fund schools. I think there needs to be a combination. Um, certainly, I do agree with um, the federal government steps in, then they should help fund. Um, and not only, uh, he gave the example of special education starting at 40 percent when IDA came about in, in, the, 70, in the early 70s. Um, however, we haven't received the 40 percent, and instead of going up with inflation and receiving additional funds, they have consistently declined to about 17 percent now, um, and we are spending lots of money, especially in special education. I'm, I'm one of the big, biggest budgets in, in the district, um, so that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect that I was going to mention here in funding when I feel that it's a combination, um, I, I personally don't think the way that Illinois funds um, education is equitable uh, as, as far as relying totally uh, or majority on property taxes when we have communities that um, have low property taxes thereby the schools are suffering in those areas. And, Prior to me coming here, I was in uh, Cook County School District 130, and that services Blue Island, Alsup, Robbins, and a part of Crestwood. And I've worked previously in Chicago Public Schools and all the way south at home with Flossmoor High School. So I've seen different areas and how schools, are, and I live in Frankfurt. So if, if you've ever been out to Frankfurt, the schools are phenomenal. I mean, they have different gyms, a gym for weed, a gym for rock climbing. The disparities are just atrocious because we rely heavily on our property taxes. And so I think it's going to require a combination of a lot of things, uh, federal government, state, um, and, and maybe property taxes in there as well. There is a little bit of promise I'd want to speak to, though, from, uh, regarding federal from the funding, uh, excuse me, funding from the federal level. Uh, there is an act that's being put forth in front of Congress right now uh, called the State and Local Funding Flexibility Act which is being spearheaded by uh, Representative John Klein from Minnesota. Um, and the premise of this act is that it would allow local school boards some flexibility in directing funds from the federal government mm -hmm. towards programs that are all about student achievement. And that's really a first from the federal government. Now, this is one piece of uh, what uh, Representative Klein is trying to put together as kind of an omnibus uh, ESEA reauthorization. And uh, as you're probably aware, there are many different components that will likely go into the reauthorization of that piece of legislation in the end. But it offers some promise, and if nothing else, even if it were not to pass, it, I think it represents um, an acknowledgment by the federal government that, uh, again, states and local school boards need to have some discretion 
in order to support the programs that they're responsible for. Uh, there has been a movement, regrettably, afoot uh, in some places in this country um, looking and questioning at the uh, power of school boards to make the best decisions for their constituents. And this is ridiculousness. There's no better uh, educated and uh, capable uh, group of people to make decisions about what's best at the local level than members of their own community. Uh, and so, you know, one thing that's very important is for the governments of both federal and state to stop passing legislation that hamstrings local school boards and uh, puts requirements, foist requirements on them uh, to institute uh, programs in a certain way or spend monies uh, with too many strings attached. Um, at this point, we're going to take a two-minute break. Okay, I've got two questions from the audience. Uh, how can colleges and universities improve teacher education? What do you see needed in this area? I, I think um, one of the colleges and universities I worked with prior to coming here was Michigan State. I think they had it right, and that was a five-year program. Mm -hmm. uh, with an internship on the part of youngsters before they really get, uh, took a, a full-time job. Uh, gave them more experience, more time. They left college with a master's degree, as, as, assumably more knowledge. The other thing I think that colleges are going to have to get uh, a lot better at is helping teachers understand the data stream and what we need to do with understanding and using data to inform instruction. Um, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that I don't believe uh, many of the colleges do as much as they can to give uh, teaching students some um, significant in-classroom uh, training prior to uh, their uh, graduating. I think all those things could uh, help, among some others probably, that panels like me. I, I would agree, um, particularly with the last thing that, that was mentioned there. I think a, an increased emphasis on instructional technique. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, there is a balance between the art and the science of teaching. Um, I don't think in, uh, you know, my years as an educator, I've run into very many situations at all where we have had teachers who maybe on the rare occasion were not successful in the classroom having a problem with content knowledge. Uh, content knowledge is very rarely the issue if a teacher mm -hmm. is less than successful. It's oftentimes the interpersonal component or the instructional technique that is problematic. And like anything that's of value, uh, instructional technique can be practiced and it can be improved upon. And um, you know, the first year in a classroom uh, is probably not the best time, you know, as a full-time teacher, is not the best time to be doing that. If we could have greater opportunity to provide um, uh, teachers in training with chances to practice in uh, lower stakes um, environments, um, not only would it be helpful for the students that are then exposed to the work of the first year teacher, but it would give those teachers much, much more confidence. Um, we all have to start our career and our profession somewhere, and so it's expected that early teachers are going to have some areas in which they need to ramp up quickly and grow. But um, our goal as administrators is to provide the supports for them that are necessary and to help them to move as quickly as possible to a level of high efficiency uh, and effectiveness for the kids. And so those are some things that could be done in college programs, uh, prep programs, to help teachers be more successful, I think. I agree with a longer program. As a matter of fact, I am a product of a non-traditional way into education. My first, this is my second career, and I'm pretty young, and I say this is my second career, but my first career was as a social worker in the mental health field. And um, at that time, several years ago, uh, Chicago Public Schools was offering a program called Teachers for Chicago. And you actually could not have a degree in education. They were looking for professionals in other areas, and I applied for that uh, program. And what, and I attended over here at Dominican University for my master's in special ed, but from day one, I was in the classroom. So the piece about practicing your instructional practice, because the content area, our teachers will get for the most part, and it's proven in their grades. So if they're not able to do that, do that they won't even make it through the program. It's the practical experience. 
uh, that they are not as confident with. And for two years, the entire two years while I was in school, I was also assigned a teaching. And I had, I had a mentor teacher, but literally from the first day I walked in, I was teaching. And I think that helped me um, in, in uh, honing my skills, first of all. Did a lot of social work skills when I first started, but needed it where I was. Uh, but it also improved my confidence in my skills. And I was able to tap into uh, other professionals at the building. So I do believe that. Uh, I, and I'm not quite sure, I think it's a, a semester of maybe observations and then maybe a semester of student teaching that, that our uh, uh -huh. teachers have to do. I, I, some programs may require maybe a year of student teaching. Um, I'm, on, I'm under the thought that it, that piece should be longer. They're, they're going to uh, really need to be immersed in 21st century skills. They need to know the technology mm -hmm. uh, piece and know it well. Uh, but what new, well, even veteran teachers uh, sometimes need to yeah. revisit is what are the qualities of a great teacher? Understanding what they are and working toward there. And how many of you know somebody in any field that probably is decent at the field but uh, doesn't have that passion to do the job? All things considered, would rather be someplace else. Uh, we've been blessed in this profession to have uh, uh, probably a higher than average uh, percentage of folks that really have a passion about being with kids and, and, and assisting them to uh, be the best they can be. I hate to lose that. I think the uh, helping folks uh, to um, understand what it takes to be good and then also counseling some folks when that passion isn't there uh, to uh, do something else is probably wise as as well. Um, there are, as Ed says, a lot of instructional techniques that can be put to play in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't think in the, the way uh, the colleges are set up right now that they spend a nearly as enough, enough time on the instructional strategies and mm -hmm. techniques and child development. I think we spend a, uh, probably uh, much of our time on the content, which is important as well. You don't mm -hmm. want a uninformed teacher, but mm -hmm. uh, the soft skills need to be dealt with uh, as we live in a profession that relies on those greatly. One last piece I want to add in there too, and I'm not quite sure. I don't re remember too much of this, these type of classes being offered on the social emotional piece. Um, even not, not a chapter, not a unit, but a class or two devoted to that because when teachers come into our schools they are educating students that are dealing with a whole lot of other issues that maybe they themselves didn't deal with growing up and certainly not a, not us so definitely that piece need to be uh, intertwined into the curriculum with post-secondary institutions what should be changed in the way we've been conducting education in Oak Park and River Forest to ensure that students going to college do not have to take remedial classes or, or those going on to career tech courses and find good jobs. In short, um, are we truly preparing our students for productive citizenship, especially those in the middle? Uh, and that's a wonderful question. And that ought to be the focus of our work. Mm -hmm. It really ought to be the main focus of what we do. Um, you know, sometimes I'll talk with the teachers uh, in the district where I am and we, we it's, it's kind of becoming a catchphrase. You know, we're not preparing them for eighth grade graduation here. Um, it's for a, a long life where they have opportunities available to them and where they have the skills that will allow them to adapt. You know, the reality is that um, the students we're teaching today will never have a problem with access to information. Um, when we went through school, many of us in this room, uh, we were taught content because uh, if someone didn't deliver that content to us, maybe there was a thought that we might not get it. Well, it's at the children's fingertips today, and I can't imagine how easily it, how easy it will be to get that information when they're our age as adults. So the question here is very well, very well placed and very appropriate. It's how do we teach our children to be successful in the future? How do we look to the future? Um, I know that all three districts have an emphasis on technology. 
um, interestingly, all three districts represented here are implementing different technology initiatives right now in different ways um, because we find that those are the ways that we feel are going to be best suited to the students in our charge. Um, in District 90, um, we're providing our students in the eighth grade with uh, iPads and we're using them as instructional tools in the classroom, uh, tools for collaboration, um, tools for creativity, um, it, it, obviously tools to access information and to research. But, you know, it, it represents a sea change. Um, you know, one of, one of the challenges that we have as educators is that unlike the medical profession or the legal profession or banking, we've all been to school. And so um, when there's discussion about what school should look like, we all have our own opinion of that. We can all say to ourselves, oh, school, yeah, I did that. I, I know what that was like. And maybe we had a great experience, maybe not so much. But we all have in our own minds a frame of reference to this thing called school. And um, that can be a challenge because um, in any healthy community, there are going to be lots of different opinions about what that represents. Should we be instituting technology uh, and at what level? Um, should we be you know, focusing on core content? To what degree should we be looking at uh, the importance of uh, the development of the whole child, which is actually part of the mission statement in District 90, uh, incorporating things that was spoken about earlier, the arts and social emotional development. Um, it's, it's a work in progress, um, sorting these issues out in, as I said, any healthy community. Um, but at the end of the day, if the end result is not um, an education that provides a student with opportunities and is focused on longevity, we're really missing the boat. Um, so I guess the short answer is if we find that our students are leaving uh, the high school and headed off to college um, and requiring remedial courses, then you know, I think all of the districts here have additional work to do. We need to do a better job identifying what percentage of students that represents and how we can target some type of uh, improved instruction to avoid that taking place. That is a national problem. It doesn't mean that it's not a very important one for us to address here locally. But I know that unfortunately that's something that as educators generally we need to do a better job with. Um, so. I, I, I think the answer uh, from my vantage point is we're in transition. We're in transition in, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think in the teaching community we're uh, in a, a generational transition. I see fewer gray hairs and more younger folks uh, who are more able in some areas and less knowledgeable in other areas and, uh, and that mixes and matches. Uh, the transition from uh, some, some traditional type looks at classes to ones that have more integrated curriculum. I, for one, don't believe we can continue uh, very much longer just to count on silos of, oh, I'm in reading class now, so I don't have to do math, or I'm in math class, I, I have to do reading. I think we, we have to do a better job of integrating uh, subjects. I think uh, we're looking to increase the amount of project-based learning that's going on. We're looking to make sure that all the assignments that go home are meaningful and relevant. Uh, we're looking to use technology. We've done it a little differently than, um, uh, than District 90 in that we have a project with our kindergarten youngsters using uh, iPads and, uh, uh, and utilizing them at centers for uh, for their work during the day. Uh, we've extended uh, uh, by a, f a few moments, uh, uh, I guess for f 20 minutes it is, we've extended the language program at K1 and 2, believing that kids really learn language best uh, earlier rather than later, uh, with the goal being by the time these first, second uh, graders uh, reach the, uh, the uh, end of their uh, school work at District 97 that they'll be proficient in in a language. Uh, we're looking at programs that, uh, we're looking at a program that uh, has some promise at helping youngsters uh, deal with um, processing information faster and more accurately uh, than, uh, uh, th than before. And, and that's a real push because with the knowledge explosion, we want kids to be able to uh, do that at rates that uh, are faster than any previous generation, and that's just going to get 
uh, even more uh, of to become even more of a need as um, as the world continues to grow in knowledge and, and, and skill and then we're also looking at uh, uh, how do we make uh, our uh, school system very global conscious well we uh, are there's no place that I would rather be in the United States of America but we are one dot on the map our kids are going to have to function in the global world. The, the, the economy is getting more global. Our dependence on, on each other is getting more global. If you, if you don't believe that, look at the news tonight on the stock market. All of a sudden, we had a, uh, a, a huge inc uh, uh, plus in the stock market because they believe that the situation in Europe is stabilizing. So our kids ought to at least understand how we interact with uh, other nations as well. Those are all work in progress, as, uh, as uh, Ed has mentioned. Uh, but I think part of that, probably beyond the borders of our few towns here, is that's probably pretty global, because we are at a point in our country's history where there's a lot of transitioning from generation to the next generation. Well, I be whoever wrote that question, that is the million dollar question. Um, and I can say, sitting on the district leadership team at um, District 200, we are really uh, beginning, at least in my tenure here, starting to ask those hard questions like, how are we contributing to this system of our students in that average group or lower not meeting standards or acquiring uh, the equitable or having equitable access to, to classes, uh, are we contributing to tracking and thing? We are really sitting down and hashing out uh, some hard questions that we, we, we need to own up to and uh, find ways to address. Uh, what we've done, at least since the beginning of this school year, we, we've made a list uh, of different initiatives that we have. Well, the, read, the reading program that was adopted by our board last year and, and we implement it for the freshmen this year. Um, um, just a variety of different initiatives. But one of the key things that Dr. Esoy pointed out to us, these, these are just blips <laughs> in our plan. What, what we are lacking but we are working on is having a strategic plan. Because if we don't have that plan in place, that vision, these programs trying to catch a problem and not necessarily knowing for sure whether it's going to help or solve that problem, we are um, not making good use of our time or our resources. So uh, right now what we're trying to do to address that very issue is one, come up with a strategic plan, but in the meantime, as Dr. Roberts said, when you're, when you're working on things in education, it's like working on a moving car still implementing, being innovative about different programs and initiatives that we are starting. Another piece is, is the technology piece, and just specifically speaking, 